Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm your host, Jemanski, Extension Educator for Purdue University in Perry County, Indiana. And I have with me today Cora Carter, and I'll let Cora introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Cora Carter, and I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Extension Educator in Bartholomew County, Indiana. And so today we're going to present on small ruin at parasite management. And this is a topic that's really important to all of our sheep and goat producers. This particular presentation is not going to qualify you to perform FAMACHA testing on your own sheep or goats, but it's a good overview of integrated parasite management in sheep and goats. If you want online FAMACHA training that's being offered by the University of Georgia and some of our other you know, land grant institutions, and so if you just do a Google search for online FAMACHA training, that should bring up their materials. But this will kind of give you a brief overview, well, brief as in an hour or so overview of integrated parasite management. This presentation was originally developed by Susan Shannon, who's a sheep and goat specialist at the University of Maryland. And I've provided some modifications to the presentation to make it fit within our time limit and just to update it with some of our new and emerging issues with parasite management. So there's a group within the U.S. and actually around the world that has been doing more work than anyone else with parasite management. It's a group of veterinarians, parasitologists, animal scientists, and extension specialists called the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. And so they have a website, www.wormx.info. This is the go-to site for anything that has to do with worms around the world and particularly in the U.S. So if you want research-based information on worms and sheep and goats, that's the place to get the most updated information. And so internal parasites are the number one health problem that we see in sheep and goats in warm, moist climates. So this would be, at this point, this is pretty much the eastern half of the United States. We're now looking at warm, moist climates, at least during the summer. We found these parasites even up in Canada. So it's no longer just a southern problem. You know, this, a lot of this work started in Georgia with the University of Georgia and Fort Valley State University and some of our other land-grant institutions in the south because those were the areas that were having the most problems with these parasites. We can't say that anymore. We're seeing problems with internal parasites anywhere where you get a significant amount of rainfall in the eastern U.S. and Canada, and then also on the west coast in your wetter climates, but particularly in the east where we have the warmer, wetter climates. And sheep and goats tend to be more susceptible to livestock parasites for a number of reasons. One is, if you think about goats, they evolved as browsers, more like deer. And now they're not 100% browsers, but they, they evolved to eat off the ground. And so when they start eating grass and things that are on the ground, they're more likely to pick up these parasite eggs. And because over the millennia they have not developed resistance to these parasites because they've been eating above the ground, they're more susceptible to them. And because, you, because sheep and goat produce pellets rather than patties, they're more likely to graze close to fecal matter than cattle or horses are. We see some temporary losses of immunity during you know, times when they're stressed or around parturition. And they're also susceptible to one of the most deadly of our parasites, which is Hamonchus contortus, the barber pole worm. Another issue that we have with sheep and goats is that we can't rely on chemical dewormers anymore. We have to have a more integrated approach. For one thing, we have few you know, dewormers or anthelmetics that are FDA approved for sheep and even fewer for goats. And the worms have developed resistance to the dewormers, the chemical anthelmetics that we have. And we can't count on many new drugs coming down the pipeline because this really isn't a big money maker for our drug companies overall. So let's introduce you to the barber pole worm. The barber pole worm is the most concerning parasite of sheep and goats. 
It is a blood sucker that lives in the abomasums. The abomasum is the true stomach of the sheep or the goats. It causes anemia, pale mucous membranes. And you can see the bottle jaw, which is edema that's under the mandible or under the throat. You do not typically see diarrhea with this worm. You do see ill thrift where they're just not doing well. They're losing weight. They're not doing weight well. You can see sudden death because if you have a big flush of worms hatching out on the pasture or you have the worm larvae hatching out and you have animals that are picking up thousands and thousands of these larvae, they can actually all mature at the same time in the spring and you could have so many sucking blood inside the abomasum that they literally will suck the animal dry of blood within just a short amount of time. And that's why you see the sudden death. We see this a lot of times in animals that are under stress. They're more susceptible to these parasites. And these worms are difficult to control because they have a short direct life cycle. So you're not looking at a vector like a mosquito or some other type of, of insect or, or in the case of some of our parasites, you know, a snail is the intermediate vector. So we don't have an intermediate vector with homonchus. And so what we have is we have you know, eggs that are shed in the feces out on pasture, and Cora's going to talk about that a little bit later, and then that are hatching out, and then you have the larvae in the pasture that they're picking up. And these things can produce thousands and thousands of eggs for each you know, female worm. And so you have a high number of eggs being shed on the pasture, so you, have, you end up with high pasture infectivity. And then these also can go into a hypobiotic state, so where they're, they kind of go dormant uh, during the wintertime or, or if it's a dry period on the pasture, other kind of conditions that are adverse. And so they can survive on the pasture for a long time. And they adapt really well to a lot of different environments. And so these things are hard to get rid of. We do have some other gastrointestinal parasites that we see from the Strangile family that have a similar life cycle. These burrow into the wall of the abomasum or the intestines. So these are, are trichostrongulus in the small intestine and teledorsagia or azertasia in the abomasum. These will have an additive effect in a mixed infection. So you will probably have these plus homonchus, plus barber pole worm. Usually with these, you're going to see scouring, weight loss. You'll see a rough hair coat, ill thrift. You might see loss of appetite. So scouring, then you're probably looking at a dominant you know, composition of these as your infection versus you know, anemia, you're going to have a dominant infection of homonchus. And these tend to like the cooler weather. They don't like cold weather, but they like cooler weather a little bit better. Homonchus likes it when it's hot. These like it when it's you know, kind of spring and fall is when these are going to be your dominant parasites typically. Then we have tapeworms. They have an indirect life cycle. So they live in the small, the worms live in the small intestine and the eggs are going to pass out through the feces. The egg is going to be eaten by a mite that lives in the pasture. And then the egg is going to hatch inside the mite. And then the mite is eaten by sheep or goats as they're grazing. And this is one, it's really hard to see the eggs in the species. Or I mean, in the feces. It's really hard when we do a fecal egg count. You don't see a whole lot of those. But we do often see the segments of the tapeworm in the feces. And so we get a lot of people concerned about this parasite because they can see those tapeworm segments. Light to moderate loads of tapeworms are usually not a problem in sheep and goats. There have been studies that show that there's no difference in growth rates in lambs that are infected with tapeworms and lambs that are not infected. So if you have a very heavy load, then they can impact your gut motility. But in general, they're, they're not a blood sucker. They absorb nutrients from the digestive system. So overall, they're not a big problem for sheep and goats, but they do have the possibility to block the, the gut if you have a lot of them there. There are relatively few dewormers that actually work on these. Albendazole and praziquantel are effective, but praziquantel, as far as I know, is not labeled for ruminants in the U.S. 
lungworms can have an indirect or direct life cycle. They're transmitted through the feces, but they're difficult to see in a fecal sample. You have to use a different procedure than you would use for a typical fecal egg count. And so it's really hard to diagnose lungworms, but if you have a chronic cough that's not responding to other treatments, you might consider lungworms as a potential. Because if you have a severe infection, you can have coughing, fluid on the lungs, or pneumonia. And again, typically it takes a necropsy to diagnose these. But most of the worms that kill your stomach worms will also kill lung worms. So, that, so if you suspect a lung worm infection due to a chronic cough that doesn't respond to other treatments, you might consider lung worms as a possibility and treat as if it is lung worms. Liver flukes are not typically a problem in the Midwest, but they are a problem in very wet areas in the Gulf states and the Pacific Northwest. They require open water and snails as intermediate hosts. And they are susceptible to albendazole and ivermectin. So, so, so if you are in an area that has a problem with liver flukes, then you might consider that treatment. But again, in the Midwest, they're not typically as much of a problem. Coccidia is a very common problem in sheep and goats. It is a normal inhabitant of the ruminant GI system, and there are more than 10 species that can affect sheep or goats. But not all species are going to actually cause harm to the sheep or goats. It's a single cell protozoa. And it can damage the lining of the small intestine, and it'll affect absorption of the nutrients if you have a pathogenic variety. And so this can cause diarrhea that may be smeared with blood or mucus. And you'll see signs of disease occurring about two and a half weeks after the infection, you know, the ingestion of the oocysts. The damage, if you have a really heavy infection of coccidia, can be permanent. So good sanitation and management is important with coccidia. There are some different things you can use to reduce coccidia, such as what we call coccidia stats. So these are additives that are used in the feed, the mineral, or the water to prevent clinical disease. And so these are things that are actually not under the veterinary feed directive. So Bovitec, which is Lasalicid or menensin, which is rumensin, decoquinate de and amprolium, those do not fall under the veterinary feed directive. And so if you want to use them to manage coccidia, they're not going to treat a, a heavy coccidia infestation or infection, but they will help prevent a large infestation of coccidia. Cerecia lespedesa, there's been some research that it can help to control coccidia in a similar way to our coccidia stats. But if you have an animal that has a heavy infection, then you're going to want to treat. In this case, you're going to want you know, one of our products that requires a prescription. So toltrazoril is Baycox, Improlium, or sulfa drugs. And so any of these would require a prescription. And a lot of your sulfas fall under the veterinary feed directive, depending on how they're administered. Meningeal worm. This is one that has an indirect life cycle. It's a parasite of the white-tailed deer. And your sheep and goats are abnormal hosts for these parasites. And so they're going to affect small ruminants differently than they will deer. So deer can can harbor this parasite without too much of a problem. But once it gets into a sheep and goat, it causes a lot of issues. And so it, terrestrial snails and slugs are the intermediate host of this parasite. And so if you have goats or sheep that are ingesting, you know, if they're eating grazing on the pasture when it's wet and they ingest sheep or goats, then the larva of the meningeal worm is going to travel from the intestinal tract to the spinal cord and it's going to up to the brain, causing progressively worse symptoms. And so you're going to see a lot of neurological symptoms with meningeal worm. 
And so you will see things like lameness. A lot of times this will start in the hind end. And so you'll see hind end weakness. Yeah, the gait will be off. Eventually this will cause paralysis and death if not treated. The animals typically maintain the appetite but there's no no proven there's no proven treatment with research, but a lot of people have used high doses of dewormers, anthometics, and steroids to treat it. And those animals that do survive it typically don't have a hundred percent recovery. They can re they often will recover some function, but not a hundred percent. I personally have had a couple of animals that have survived this, and they still have a gait issue or some some lingering weakness, even after they've made a full recovery otherwise. Okay, so how do you know what kind of worms your sheep or goat have? You start with parasite identification. And so a fecal flotation or an egg count is the best way to know what parasites are infecting your sheep or goats. So with a fecal flotation or, or egg count, you can differentiate between your strongyle, your stomach and intestinal worms, tapeworms, and coccidia eggs. So these all look different from each other when you look on a fecal float. You don't see a whole lot of tapeworm eggs on a fecal float, but when you do, you know, they, they have this kind of ice cream cone shape compared to your strongyles that have the oval shape, kind of the they're a little bit bigger oval, and then you can see the different you know, parts of the worm or the, the parts of the egg on the inside. And then your coccidia are a bit smaller than your strongyle eggs. And so the oocysts, they have kind of an egg shape versus an oval shape, and they're just a little bit smaller. If you want to actually know which of the strongyles you have, then you have to do a fecal culture or there are a couple of other tests that you can do to identify your barber pole worm eggs. But with a fecal culture, a lab would take the feces and then they'd, they'd actually put them over some water and let them hatch out and then they'd identify the larvae. This is something you can learn to do on your own or there are various labs available. You know, diagnostic labs, veterinarians, and some of our private labs are all able to do Fecal flotations or fecal egg counts for sure. It's more veterinary you know, diagnostic labs that might be able to do some of the more advanced you know, things such as a larval culture or a drench right test, which is offered by the University of Georgia to see what dewormers the parasites are resistant to. And so I got ahead of myself a little bit. So the, the fecal culture you know, with the larval ID is going to be done by most of your university labs. And then at the University of Georgia, they can do the larval development assay, so the drench right test, where they will actually take these larvae, they'll expose them to the different dewormers and determine whether or not they're resistant. There's also a test where they use a stain and they can tell which eggs are homonchus in the sample based on the, you know, based on whether or not they stain. And so Oregon State University and the University of Georgia currently offer this test. This is a lot less expensive than a fecal culture larval ID. Okay, and I'll turn this over to Cora now. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, everybody, I'm going to talk a little bit about how sheep and goats actually get infected with parasites in the first place. Um, the real way that they get infected, as Sarah alluded to a little bit before, is by grazing on a pasture. So um, those worm, part of the worm life cycle requires the worm to be outside of the sheep at some point. Um, all of the worms that she mentioned have that part of a life cycle. Some of the, the life cycles also include an intermediate host. Uh, they don't all, um, but those those infective larvae need to be ingested and they go inside the sheep's body. So here's a, a photo of a simple life cycle of how the sheep ha eats the worms that are infecting um, some 
graze some forage there and then it goes down into their intestinal tract and it, they'll live in different parts of the internal part of the sheep um, depending on which type of worm it is and then the eggs of the worms will get passed out through the fecal matter of the sheep at, where it'll begin the cycle over and over again and um, you can see on the right hand side of the screen that worms worm problems will vary by a lot of factors so really it's your worm problems are going to be very specific to you and they're going to be specific to your season, the season that is that we're in and the year that we're in. So, so the worm problems you have this year may be different from the ones you had last year um, and they may be different than the farm down the road. So um, it's really important that you take a look at um, what conditions you have right now and, and do something like a fecal egg test like Sarah was talking about to kind of see what you're dealing with before you start dealing with it. Um, so the best way uh, to deal with worm issues is through integrated parasite management. So the goal of that means that we're not gonna just give them a silver bullet and there's gonna be this one drug that solves all your problems. Um, that's not gonna happen. That's never gonna happen with any a disease or issue that you have, of course. And so um, the goal is not to create parasite free animals because that's just impossible. Um, but the goal is to prevent disease and production loss. Um, and that really goes d back to um, one of those factors is resistance. So uh, certain animals are going to be more resistant to um, worms than other animals and then even different classes of worms they may be more susceptible to different classes than others as well so you can see on the left hand side of the screen um, the most susceptible animals will be your your weaker immune animals so your lambs um, those that are in high production um, those that are older um, or that are um, born at a different season than others um, and then less susceptible are going to be mature animals, males, dry use, pets, things that animals that aren't um, under a large amount of stress normally. You'll also notice that here there's um, goats are on the left hand side of the screen and unadapted breeds. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see hair sheep. Um, there are some some breeds and some animals that are um, genetically less resistant and more resistant and we're going to talk about that a little more in a little bit um, so parasite control also goes beyond um, the genetic inherent resistance to um, just good management so good sanitation is always a great place to start if you're having any issues um, clean everything out and and kind of start from a clean slate um, as well as using feeders because the the fecal to oral uh, transmission is one of the is part of the worm life cycle so the worm really needs to get into the mouth of the animal and that's those eggs come out of the fecal matter so if you use feeders that are up off the ground those help prevent um, contamination same with the um, water. If you have some fecal matter in the water, you need to completely dump the tank and start over because that could be con potentially contaminated. Overstocking can also lead to issues just because there's so many animals next to each other. It's easier for them to um, be both stressed out and exposed to um, fecal matter from other animals. And also that you should um, isolate any new animals onto your farm as well. Um, this slide is, talks a little bit about how certain seasons of the year have a higher worm load than others. So um, lambing in the winter time may mean that you are able to get those lambs off your farm um, or your kids off your farm um, but before the real heavy uh, summer worm load comes along. Um, but as Sarah was mentioning, uh, some of the worms do prefer cooler temperatures and may um, be spreading out throughout more of the year. So this may not be uh, a completely perfect uh, representation of what might happen, but it is a good thing to keep in mind. 
Um, this is talking about uh, how we can rotate our pastures to make sure that um, we keep time between the sheep's fecal matter that has those e those worm eggs in there and when the, the sheep or goats are returning to that pasture. Um, there's also other ways to have a clean pasture, a, a brand new pasture that's never had any animals on it at all, or one that has been renovated with uh, tillage or um, grazed by mostly horses and cattle in the past six to 12 months, um, or where a, another crop has been removed, um, or, or it's been burned in the past. Those pastures are completely clean and safe and um, are a great way for you to make sure there's gonna be no worm issues if you put in clean animals into it. Um, grazing multiple species together or rotating them together can help uh, reduce the worm load. The cattle and horses can actually kind of vacuum the worm larva off of the, the grass because if there are more animals eating it, eating the grass, then there are less worms that are able to infect the sheep and goats that are in there. Um, so that actually can help get rid of some of your worm issues because the sheep will have less worm eggs to be eating. Pasture rotation is really important. Um, and I kind of mentioned that before. The, you wanna make sure that you're rotating your pastures, but if you don't rest your periods long enough, then you're actually helping the worm life cycle uh, to perpetuate because if those eggs are waiting for a certain amount of time on the ground and you use that same amount of time as your pasture rotation, you're actually just making sure that your goats and sheep are infected when you rotate back in there. So you really shouldn't return the animals to the same pasture for two to three months. That way um, it, it allows those worm eggs to become non-viable and that helps the sheep to, and goats to not be uh, infected. There's also um, alternative forages that can work for, for you. Um, a lot of livestock that browse, I know our goats are more interested in the browsing than the sheep. Um, they can graze these the trees or brush that's up off the ground and that can actually help uh, reduce parasite loads because the parasites do prefer to live uh, down on the first two inches of vegetation um, and the grass. So the tall growing forages are going to have less less parasite problems, especially uh, the, the tandiferous forages. They also may help reduce the effects of parasitism as well. There's also some types of forages that have shown uh, less fecal e uh, egg counts um, that they actually inhibit larval development. So these uh, three forage chicory, bird's foot trefoil, and Sericea lispidaza are actually three types of forage that you might want to intersperse in with your grazing pastures to help reduce fecal egg counts. Um, that, that might be something that helps you in your uh, facilities. Uh, nutritional management is also important. As we mentioned before, uh, a stressed out animal is one that's more susceptible to parasite infection. So if your animals are on a high plane of nutrition and better condition, they're better able to withstand the worm burdens. Um, and, and especially those in early pregnancy, you wanna make sure those have good nutrition that can affect, really affect their immune response because pregnancy can be very stressful to our animals. If you supplement your grazing lambs with protein, that can also help reduce fecal egg counts um, because of that same same idea, the nutritional management, um, higher plane of nutrition is better for your animals in the long run. Zero grazing is, is by using a dry lot or bedded pins with slatted floors, they actually, um, those sheep and goats aren't even grazing at all. So there's actually less problems with uh, worm transmission because the worms do need that um, part of their life cycle to be out in the pasture. And so sheep and goats are also spending less time with their mouths on the ground. Um, so as long as you have higher 
raised feeders and things like that, um, you probably won't have a problem with worms in a, in a dry lot uh, situation. However, uh, coccidiosis can be a problem if you don't do some preventative measures. And those preventative measures are like we mentioned before, just good sanitation, raised feeders, and using some coccidiostats to help manage that. Uh, genetics play an important role in worm infection. Um, there's two important traits, resistance and resilience. So resistance is the, the actual ability to limit infection. So they just don't have as many um, worms living inside of them. And you can, you can see that on their fecal egg counts um, of the amount of worms that you have inside the animal at any given time. Um, resilience is a little bit different. It's their ability to withstand infection. So their ability to continue uh, being healthy and productive, even with a worm, a high worm count. So you can see that with a, a blood hematocrit or a packed cell volume, and that's what your FAMACHA score is estimating. Um, so you might be able to see using the FAMACHA um, method whether the, your animals are resilient. And parasite traits are not, um, they're moderately heritable. So if you have an animal that is really resistant and resilient or one or the other, um, that that might be a good animal to keep around uh, as a breeding animal because those traits are a little bit her heritable. And this is another slide that mentions those um, certain breeds of sheep and goats are more resistant than uh, not. Those, the, some other ones that are not. And um, basically it, it's kind of the, the wilder type of sheep and goats, the ones that are more like an, a wild or native breed um, are the ones that are a little bit more resistant and ones that are not are the ones that are uh, usually the really high production animals. So your, your traditional wool breeds on your sheep, uh, your boar and dairy goats and your angora goats. Um, those are ones that are not resistant. So those are some that you might wanna consider crossbreeding if that's something that interests you or just kind of choosing um, your battles. So if you if you desire to have those types of animals that are not resistant, you are gonna be facing some uh, worm battles. Yet you can still see that there are some uh, animals that are more resistant than others. So even within a certain breed, you may still be able to find animals that are resistant and and like I said before, you wanna kind of focus on those and cull the ones that are worm susceptible to kind of make your flock move uh, in the positive direction. Only those males that are resistant should be used for breeding. And finally, there's this um, comparison of genetic and non-genetic control strat strategies, which is a, it's a, comes from a paper in, out of Australia in 2002 that shows that genetic selection is actually 69% um, shows a reduction in fecal egg counts as compared to protein supplementation and strategic deworming. So the genetic selection, the culling of animals that are not resistant is the best way to reduce your fecal egg count. However, if you do that and you supplement protein and you strategically deworm, you're combining all of those percentages together and really increasing your ability to, to fight off the, the worm pressure. Okay, now let's talk about the tools that we have in our toolbox. And so, you know, drugs, chemical dewormers, anthemetics, they are a valuable limited resource that we have to manage properly because we don't have a whole lot of new ones coming. So we currently have three drug families that are available for us to use in the United States. And so these are drugs that kill parasites by starving them or paralyzing them. So we have three different classes of dewormers. We have our benz benzimidazoles. And so these are the ones that's chemical name ends in dazole. They include finbendazole, albendazole, and oxybendazole. So products such as Safeguard and Valbazin are, are benzidimidazoles. Then we have our nicotinics, 
which include Levamisole, Morintel, and Pirintel. And we have our macrolytic lactones, which are avermectins and our milbamycins. So ivermectin, doramectin, and moxidectin fall into that class. And so we'll go into a little bit more detail about each class. So the benzodimidazoles are our oldest class of dewormers that we have, that we currently use in the United States. And so because of this, we have a lot of resistance to them across the board. They tend to be fairly safe dewormers with the exception of albendazole during, during pregnancy for sheep and goats. So you do not want to use albendazole or valbazin in pregnant, pregnant animals. They do have the advantage that they are the only class of dewormers that's approved for ruminants in the U.S. that is effective on tapeworms. And a single dose is not going to be effective on tapeworms. It takes doses three days in a row for tapeworms. Now, we ha there is research that has found that fasting animals prior to administering your ben benzimidazoles can help with the efficacy. And so because we do see so much resistance, we want to make sure that if we are going to use them, we use them properly in the way that we're going to have the most efficacy. So fasting the animals for 24 to 48 hours prior to administering one of these dewormers can increase the efficacy. Then we have our nicotinics. So levamisol is the one that is going to be most effective for most, you know, for most farms. We have less resistance to this than any of the others, and that's because it has the lowest margin of safety of any of our dewormers. This means that it has not been used as much as our others. And so we have to be very careful in weighing the animals and properly dosing levamisole to make sure that we don't in have toxicity you know, with our animals when we use this dewormer. Morintel is one of the few dewormers that is actually labeled for goats. Unfortunately, you know, the form in which it's labeled is a pellet that you have to feed the goats. And Cora will talk about this a little bit later, but have you ever tried to get goats to eat something they didn't want to eat? Particularly a large amount, since it takes a fair number of these pellets to be able to be effective. And then Pirintel, which is your Strongid products, as far as I know, is not labeled for ruminants in the U.S. It is available for horses, but it is not labeled for ruminants in the U.S. Our macrolides, we have our avermectins, which is ivermectin and doramectin. This is our newest class of dewormers. It's broad spectrum. It will get hypobiotic larvae. It will get pretty much all stages, which you know, some of our other dewormers are only going to get adults. They may not get the larval stages. Unfortunately, we have a lot of resistance to our avermectins. You know, because the, the macrolides, because they stay in the system a lot longer, then you have more of an opportunity for your different you know, parasites to get resistance to these. We see less resistance to cydectin than we see to our avermectins, but we're still seeing resistance to cydectin. There is a wide margin of safety with these, and so we don't have to worry about these qu with a dose quite as much as we do with levamisol. We want to make sure that we do not underdose because underdosing any of these you know, creates more opportunity for the development of resistance of the parasites to the dewormers. And so unfortunately, when we use a dewormer most of the time with sheep or goats, we're going to be looking at extra label drug use, particularly with goats. Only finbendazole, which is safeguard, and Morintel, you know, Rumitel would be a brand name, are FDA approved for goats and only at the dosages listed on the label. Unfortunately, the doses listed on the label are not effective against parasites in goats. And so you actually have to use those at greater you know, in a greater amount, a greater dose than what's on the label. So you're ending up with extra label drug use. And so anytime you use a product different from what the label says, is extra label drug use and you require it requires a veterinary prescription and a valid veterinarian pa patient client relationship and the veterinarian is responsible for establishing the withdrawal time for extra label drug use and so you want to make sure you work with your veterinarian on deworming your animals 
There are some charts that are developed by veterinarians available you know, on the Wormex website. They were developed by veterinarians at the University of Georgia with effective dosages for each of these products. And so anytime you use a product extra label, the withdrawal time is going to be longer than what's on the label. So the meat withdrawal for the Cydectin drench is 23 days when you administer to goats at double the dosage as compared to seven days for sheep because the label dose is for sheep. And so if you use the sheep product on goats at double the dosage, you have a meat withdrawal that's more than three times longer than for sheep. And then if you use Cydectin injectable, which you know, again, extra label, it's a cattle product, you're looking at a meat withdrawal of 120 to 130 days compared to 21 days for cattle. And so this is really not something you want to do if you're trying to market these goats. And you want to make sure you keep records and again work with your veterinarian when using these products on goats and sheep. So unless you're using it according to the label on sheep, you're going to need to work with your veterinarian. So in the future for parasite control, we do have one new dewormer that is on the market in other countries that we know will come here eventually but we've been waiting about a decade for this dewormer we've been known we've known it's out there for a decade but it is not yet on our market we also have some natural dewormers that have been proven through research these include copper oxide wire particles nematode trapping fungi and cerisia lespediza and some of our other you know, plant-based you know, products there is work on vaccination, and I did see that there was some more research that actually showed some efficacy with vaccination this year. And then using gene markers to help select our animals to determine which ones are more resistant to parasites. So Zolvix, you know, or Mani Patel, this is the new drug class that is available pretty much everywhere in the world except the U.S. And they have tested in the U.S., but it's not yet released. I believe the FDA actually has approved it. It just hasn't been released by the company. And we don't know if it's going to be approved for goats. It does kill worms that are resistant to other anthelmintics. And that is a good thing. It's our first new anthelmintic class in 25 years. And it has a different mode of action from our other classes of dewormers. Unfortunately, we're already seeing resistance to this dewormer in other parts of the world, particularly New Zealand, where it was first used. And so we are seeing, you know, resistance to Zolvix. And so we know that when it is released, we want to make sure we use it very carefully to prevent the development of resistance here. A lot of our, quote, natural anthelmintics have not been proven to work in a laboratory setting or in a research setting. And there are universities that have done tests with all of these products. And none of these have been shown to be effective. Some of them may have nutritional benefits, and if you improve nutrition, you can reduce the number of animals that require treatment because you have an improved plan of nutrition. But as far as dewormers, these have not been proven to be effective as dewormers. Copper oxide wire particles, on the other hand, have been demonstrated in studies to be effective against homonychus. They have not been shown to be effective against some of our other stomach worms, but barber pole worm or homonychus you know, we do definitely see an effect on that particular parasite. So these are made from Copisher, which is a copper bolus that's marketed for copper deficiency in cattle. And when you're using it for sheep and goats, you want to repackage into doses that are suitable for sheep and goats. The sheep and goat product that's sold by Copisher is actually more than what you need to be effective on parasites, the two, which are the two and four gram doses. And so the minimum dose that's demonstrated control is half a gram. You may need the higher doses, but probably not. If you are going to use copper bolusing, you want to be really careful with the mineral that you provide to goats because we have seen, in the past year, I've seen several reports of copper toxicity in goats due to animals that were on a high copper mineral and being given copper boluses. So you want to be really careful with this. And you want to make sure that you use the FAMACHA system or fecal egg counts to determine which ones need a copper bolus and be careful of copper toxicity. 
One of the most exciting things that's come on the market within the last year is nematode trapping fungi. This isn't cheap, but what this does is it provides biological control of the infectious nematode larvae in the environment. So it's a feed through product. You can either get a feed supplement or you can have it mixed with your feed if you work through a feed mill. And so this product is out of, I believe, Australia. It's either Australia or New Zealand, or maybe New Zealand. And so these are fun, uh, fungal spores that pass through the digestive tract and they develop in the feces and they'll attack the nematode larvae in the feces. They do not become established in the environment. So it's something that you need to feed for the entire time that you have the infective season. So from the time your weather warms up and you start having parasites reproducing in the pasture, that's when you want to be feeding this to your animals. And what this will do is this will reduce the amount of nematodes, the amount of infectious larvae in the pasture. It's not going to get rid of worms altogether, but it will reduce reinfections. And so we can measure our resistance to these dewormers through a fecal egg count reduction test. That's probably the cheapest way to measure resistance. So what you want to do is you want to conduct a fecal egg count prior to deworming. So you can do this yourself with a microscope and McMaster slides and their instructions on the Wormex website on how to do that. Or you could, you know, we may have, you know, workshops in the future on how to you know, conduct egg count. And so you're going to do this before you deworm. Then you're going to deworm your animal. You want to leave some animals dewormed, or so you want to no, you want to leave some animals that are not dewormed as your control group. So you'll take this percentage of animals, you're going to deworm these ones. You'll have these animals that you're not deworming, but you're going to go ahead and do a fecal egg count on all of these animals. You're going to deworm the animals that you're going to deworm, and then two weeks later, you're going to do another fecal egg count, and you're going to look for a reduction in the number of eggs. If you have less than 95% egg reduction, you have some resistance to the drugs that you're using. If you have less than 60% egg reduction, you have severe resistance. And now, if you, want, if you want an answer sooner, and if you want somebody else to do it, and you're not afraid of the money, you can send a sample to the University of Georgia for the drench right test. I believe it costs about $250 to get the drench right test done. But it will tell you exactly what your parasites are resistant to. But in general, anthelmintic resistance is caused by the overuse and misuse of our dewormers. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Cora. All right, so we're going to just talk a little bit about these different classes of um, dewormers and their resistance uh, across the U.S. here. Um, Safeguard and Valbazin, you see here their trade names there is some widespread resistance to those two uh, classes of chemical, or two specific trade names. Um, and levimazole is still effective in many places. Ivermectin has widespread resistance, as Sarah already talked about a little bit, and moxidectin is somewhat still effective. Um, that has been de decreasing over recent years. Um, it used to be a little bit more effective, and now it's it's less effective because of the overuse and misuse of the drugs that we currently have. And we need to be careful about taking care of the drugs that we do have because, as Sarah was saying, they've been trying to get um, the most recent uh, new drug approved for 20... For how long did you say, Sarah? 10 years? It's It's been more than 10 years. Yeah, since they yeah. started developing it, yes. Since it's right. available so, in other countries. Right. So um, it's it's been a long road for that one drug that we can't even use yet, so we don't want to lose any of the more of the ones that we've got. Um, do not overuse drugs, especially the ones we do have that are still effective. And do not introduce resistant worms to your farm. So the best way to do that is to isolate your new animals and deworm them with a uh, two different chemical classes, and that way you'll make sure those are clean animals coming into your farm. You want to make sure and use the right dosage, so don't underdose. Uh, weigh your animals and dose for 
um, the correct weight or dose for the heaviest animals in the group with those safer chemical um, dewormers. Uh, again, with the new dewormers that the not quite uh, we're not quite sure how safe they are. Make sure you use the exact right dosage for the right um, weight of the animals. Don't rotate dewormers after each treatment. Rotate them annually and then rotate among drug families from one family to another. Use specific dewormers for specific situations. Save the really most effective dewormers for your, your really worst cases or um, and especially this last one is really important. Don't treat everybody. Leave some of your animals untreated because those animals have uh, will be your refuge. And we're going to talk about that on this next slide. Um, your refuge is um, worms that are not exposed to the drug. So those worms that you allow to continue living in the animals that you don't treat are, are worms that have never seen that drug before. So they're still susceptible to the treatment. Um, and, and so they will continue to, to breed and, and put eggs out into the environment and you'll continue to have those susceptible worms in your pastures, which is uh, what you're wanting. You want to, your drugs to continue working in the future. So after you deworm, don't move your animals to a clean pasture because then all of the fecal matter that comes out of those animals um, after you're deworming them is gonna be eggs from the resistant worms. So you're going to just be creating a pasture that's full of resistant worms. Um, you don't have to deworm every animal. So if you dewormed every single animal, you'd be getting rid of all of those susceptible worm parents there on the left hand side. And you those two resistant worms that survive the deworming event are going to be the ones that breed the next generation. So those worms that are able to survive are going to be creating more worms that can survive. And, and that's what you really don't want to, to occur. So again, you want to give the proper dose, don't underdose. Um, dose orally, um, we're going to talk about that on the next slide a little bit. Um, you want to make sure you deposit it down in the esophagus to prevent the, the drug from bypassing the rumen or from getting out of the animal altogether. You want to make sure it really goes down in there. Um, and as Sarah was mentioning, you can fast the animals to increase the efficacy of some of your drugs. Um, and you can use a higher dose for goats than listed on the label, um, but you really want to consult with your veterinarian about the proper dosing for goats. So don't do that unless you have consulted with your veterinarian in the past. Um, if you use two drugs from two different chemical classes, then you can kind of get a synergistic effect if that's um, what you're going for in, in your flock. Um, as far as roots of administration, really we recommend that you stick with the oral drench. Um, the, the oral transmission is going to be the best route for you. Um, it's one of only two ways that are FDA approved. Um, the other being the medicated pellet. And as Sarah was mentioning before, it's hard to get an animal to eat something that they don't want to eat. So if they're if they're not eating all of the dose, then they're getting underdosed and that can really contribute to our um, to our worm resistance issues. So these oral drenches are going to be your best route of, of administration. Um, in the past, uh, there's been some poron cydectin that we used as an oral drench and we really recommend you not doing that anymore. There is an oral cydectin that is um, approved. So don't use a, a, a poron as an oral drench. That's not uh, recommended. Um, and we really shouldn't be using any non FDA approved um, chemical uh, worm dewormer in any way. Um, again, there is a, a temporary loss of immunity to parasites at the time of parturition, which is a really high stress time for our animals. So that increases egg counts. Um, so especially if you're having all of your animals give birth in the same space of time, that egg count is going to go through the roof in your in your pasture. Um, so that can also, depending on what time of the year you um, are, are lambing or kidding, um, you're going to have, uh, that's going to help 
with your hypobiotic li larva resuming their life cycles in the spring. So you want to make sure that you're uh, deworming with an anthelminic that is effective against those hypobiotic larvae, and you're going to increase your protein in late gestation to um, help make sure that the animal is less stressed. Um, you do want to be careful with that because you don't want them too fat when they're uh, lambing, as, as Sarah talked about a little bit in the uh, the lambing and kidding session. Um, that there can be issues if you have too fat of an animal when they're giving birth, but um, do increase their protein a little bit to kind of counter that stressfulness. And finally, the, the ultimate thing, if you take away one thing from this presentation, I really hope it's that you only deworm sheep and goats when they need it, and you don't just deworm every sheep or goat in your herd at the same time, um, because that's really how we have some issues with our, um, uh, with uh, with wormer resistance, I'm sorry, and that is the real issue we're having because some of those dewormers, we're losing the ability to use them because they're not effective anymore, and that's just um, causing a lot of trouble for us. So if you can use your fecal egg counts and the FAMACHA to determine the need for deworming, you can only deworm the animals that really need it. And uh, now Sarah's going to talk a little bit about the, the FAMACHA program. So FAMACHA is a tool that we have to use to determine which animals need to be dewormed. And as I said before, this is this does not certify you to be able to use the FAMACHA program, but University of Georgia and some other universities have collaborated to offer an online FAMACHA training. And so if you want to look that up, that would be a great opportunity for you. And University of Georgia is doing a more in-depth parasite series. So if you want more information about goat and sheep parasites, then it, I would recommend their series on parasites that go over different parasite topics each week. And so FAMACHA is a, is a system that was developed in South Africa by Dr. Francois Milan. And so it's short for Fafa Malan chart. And so it was in response to you know, severe anthelmintic resistance in that country. And it's a system to assess anemia caused by Homonchus contortus or barber pole worm and the need for deworming those animals. And so I actually had the privilege of studying under you know, someone who worked directly with Dr. Milan. And so I say I only have two degrees of separation from Dr. Milan because my major professor worked directly with him. And so FAMACHA uses different colors of, you know, within the inner eyelid to determine whether or not a goat is anemic. And this has been validated through research to, you know, to assess a particular packed cell volume range for each color on the FAMACHA chart. You want to make sure that if you use this, you actually use the card. You don't just look at the animal's eyelid. You want to make sure you have that card for comparison. And so what it does as the tool is it helps you reduce the number of treatments as a whole to your herd or flock by determining which animals to treat. And it reduces the rate of which the worms are going to, de to develop the drug resistance by increasing the refugia, the number of worms that are still susceptible to your treatment. And so it also identifies the animals that need treatment most often and helps you dis determine which ones to cull. As we said before, resistance is 20 to 40 percent heritable, and 20 to 30 percent of your flock harbors most of your worms. And so, if you can cull that 20 to 30 percent that are providing most of the worm output, you can reduce the total number of worms shed on your pasture any given year. And so, this really helps you identify those animals that you should be culling. And so, kind of a rule that I like to use is if I have an animal that, given the same management as every other animal, has to be dewormed much more frequently, then that's an animal that's a, you know, that's a candidate for culling. And so some things to remember is that this is only useful if barber pole worm, Homonchus contortus, is your primary parasite species. You can't just use FAMACHA. You need to use other factors. So 
and we're going to talk about with the five point check in just a couple of slides. There are other causes of pale or red eyelids, and you want to take that into consideration. And you want to make sure that you use this as part of an integrated parasite management program, including proper dewormer use, including pasture rest and rotation, including fecal egg counting, keeping feet out of the feeders, etc. And so if you are going to use this for deworming, you need to know if your dewormer is effective to start with. Because you don't want to take an animal that is very sick, that's very pale, and give them a dewormer that's not effective. And then the question that we get is, how often should you check animals? Well, it depends on the season and the weather. If it's warm and wet, if it's above 80 degrees and wet, I would check on a weekly basis. And again, always use the card. You want to make sure you compare the eye color to the chart. And you want, if you're using the card regularly, you want to make sure that you replace it every year. So you, so you're not comparing to too pale of a comparison. You want to make sure you keep the card in a dark place, maybe an envelope in a drawer between use. And again, it should only be used by properly trained individuals because if you're looking at the wrong place, you might think the animal's fine when it's not. And so the five point check is something that's been developed out of FAMACHA. And so in this case, you're, looking, you're using FAMACHA to assess for anemia. You're also looking at the back. You're doing body condition scoring, and we've talked about that in some of our previous presentations. And then you're looking at the hind end. Are there, is there signs of diarrhea? Are there, yeah, is there soiling on the, back of, on the back legs of the animals, on the tail? Look at the nose. Is there nasal discharge? Could be, there be nose bots or something like that? And nose bots are not something we often see in the U.S., but it's something you see in other countries more commonly. Look at the jaw. Is there swelling or edema? Do we see signs of bottle jaw? And so it takes more than just looking at one part of the animal to be able to assess whether or not they need to be treated for worms. You need to look at all of these different factors. And so this is what the scorecard looks like for the five-point check. And so it incorporates FAMACHA, but it adds in more factors to help you determine, does this animal need treatment? But overall, parasite control in sheep and goats requires an integrated approach. So there are different things that we want to use. We want to use all of these different factors to be able to manage parasites in our small ruminants. Okay, we'll go ahead and take some questions. You can type them into the chat box. Sarah, I've already answered a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, one was who offers FAMACHA training? And so I actually went to the Wormex website and was able to, uh, they have a list of workshops. Some of them have already, um, actually all of the ones listed on this website have already started, but those are actually good places for you to go uh, see if they're gonna do it again. Um, and kind of keep that website up to date. Um, and then another one is, will oral drenches kill lung worms? And yes, there are some drenches that are effective against lung worms as well. Right, you just have to check and see if they're labeled for lung worms. That's right. Yes. But I believe definitely your you know, moxidectin and ivermectin should be. Yep, yep. That's the one that I mentioned there in the chat as well. Do we have any other questions? A question in the chat box, um, can we send the link via Facebook? I think that you can just click on the link right there in the chat box and it should open up a new browser window if, um, so that you can answer the Qualtrics survey. I can post it to Facebook if you would like. Is that the, we did record this and so if you have friends that you want to see this, go ahead and, you know, I'll have it posted to my YouTube channel tomorrow. And so you can share it with your friends. So any other questions? Um, there's one that's how to identify which goats are naturally resistant to parasites. That's where you would want to use you know, a fecal egg count reduction test for your entire herd. And if you, if you fecal test your entire herd, you can see which of your animals are more resistant simply because if you have animals under the same management, 
then those that are resistant are gonna have a lower fecal egg count. And those that are less resistant are gonna have a higher fecal egg count. Now you can also identify your resilient animals this way as well, because your resilient animals are the ones that are gonna have a high fecal egg count, but still be in great condition. And so all of your previous, all the previous presentations, those are the link that I gave you will give you folder. There are subfolders within that folder that have all the previous presentations for all the workshops that we've done so far. And do you have a link for the YouTube channel that you could put in the box in case um, people want to look at the past presentations? Sure, I'll get that. Let's see. For some reason, I'm having trouble with my mouse. Well, I will post it. I'll post that link. It's on my Facebook page. So if you just type my name into Facebook, or if you type my name into YouTube, you should be able to find me. For some reason, I'm not able to copy and paste right now. There we go. Now I can. There it is. All right, yep, so she just placed that in the chat box. If anybody wants to look at any of the past presentations, there's been some great information on uh, lambing and kidding and forages and nutrition. Um, what else have you done, Sarah? Okay, so I have, well, I just see another question coming in. So I'm preparing my farm to get some sheep. I have three ewes coming from Wisconsin in the next couple of weeks, and then three ewes coming from Pennsylvania later this summer. Should I plan to worm these sheep when they get here to avoid contamination of my pasture? I know the three sheep from Wisconsin have been, used, have been wormed twice a year using Panicure. Should I use combination of wormers? I do not have a microscope to do a fecal count. How many should I worm? All of them or just some of them to help with resistance? Okay, what I would do is I would ask your veterinarian if they can do a fecal egg count. And I would only deworm those that have a high fecal egg count. And then when you, with those that you do deworm, you want to leave some not dewormed. But those that you do deworm use two different classes of dewormers since you have a new flock. Now, if you were introducing them to an existing flock, I would say deworm all of them. But since this is a new flock, I would not deworm all of them. Any other questions? Yes, I will go ahead. You should be able to just click on the links that are currently in the chat box, but I will go ahead and post them to my Facebook page later today. Thank you all for joining us, and we will see you next week for Hoof Care. Thank you, everybody.